Welcome to the Cross Border Interviews, the show where we bring you up close and personal with some of Canada's most exciting and vibrant communities. My name is Christopher Brown, and I will be your host for this exciting journey. This episode of the Cross Border Interviews was recorded live at the Saskatchewan Urban Municipality Association Conference in Saskatoon in April. Our show is dedicated to sitting down with local elected leaders from communities all across Canada, and our goal is to learn about who they are, what drives them, and how they are working to make their communities a better place for everyone who lives there. Today's guest is Lloydminster Councillor Aaron Buckingham. I want to start with the first question, which is, where did your sense of duty to serve come from, Aaron? You know, I think it was growing up in a small town in Saskatchewan. And, you know, to be honest, I didn't have a lot of friends or a lot of people I hung out with socially, except uh, people that were much older than me at 14, 15 years old. Uh, I got involved with a music festival that we ran back in my hometown that was the basic fundraiser to keep our old arena up and running for the course of the year. So I ended up working on the committee, booking entertainment and traveling around and doing this with people that were 20 and 30 years older than me. Uh, and that was my first real community service type thing to keep our rink going. At, I think I was 14 or 15 so when I started that. where are you originally that. from? I'm from know? Rabbit Lake, Saskatchewan. I have no idea. And where most that. people don't. So where is Rabbit Lake, so, Saskatchewan? So uh, about 100 miles straight north of Saskatoon where we're sitting today. So it's okay. about two hours from here straight north. So what brought you to Lloydminster? Was it just work? So, or? Yeah, yeah. I, I call my tenure in Lloydminster the Gilligan's Island. You know, it was a three-hour tour. I, I came to Lloyd in 1997 on a three-month radio practicum and uh, started working at what was then 1080 CKSA AM radio and uh, never really left. Oh, wow. So you've literally been there for some time. Yeah. What made you finally take the leap into municipal politics? Was it something that you were interested in or was it something that you were even considering when you first moved to Lloydminster? Or was it something so far off your radar that when you finally did put your name forward, it was kind of a shock to even yourself? You know, uh, this position was a, a bit of a progression. Uh, for me, it's always about serving others and uh, my own personal company and everything else. And my own personal mission statement in life is a simple one. It's that you focus on the success of others and your success will naturally follow. That's my company motto. It's my personal mission statement, all of that stuff. So back in 2005, I was uh, fortunate enough to be the Chamber of Commerce president in Lloydminster. I served a, a term and I a half. I now know where you are yeah. from because yeah. I, I worked at Lloydminster Source. I remember that. Okay. Yeah. Now two and two equals four yeah. now. Okay. Sorry. I yeah. apologize. No, no. All good. So, so I was Chamber president in 2005. I uh, was Rotary president, fortunate enough to do that for almost two years. That's usually a one-year term, but we had somebody get transferred away for work, so I had the blessing to have a longer term as a Rotary president. Uh, I'm now 25 years with a rural fire department that surrounds the Saskatchewan northeast side of Lloydminster, so I've been 25 years doing that. I was 20 years uh, working with the ambulance service in Lloydminster as a, as a casual position. And I find my greatest happiness is helping others and seeing others succeed. So for me, it's like, how, how can I make that progression? I've been chamber president in a few of these things. How else can I serve the community in a greater role? So I put my name forward for municipal politics in 2016 and was fortunate enough to, to garner enough support to do that, not once but twice so far. Uh, so that's been exciting for me. So what was the issue for you? What was the issue? You can give back many different ways, but municipal politics is a completely new realm. Municipal government is a new realm. What was the issue for you that you said, okay, now is the time and this is X. This yep. X issue needs to be addressed and my background with the chamber, with my firefighters a background, would be the best uh, person and best background to address this issue. You know, or mine, was there an issue? There, you know, it's funny what, what you think the issue is going into something um, to what you find out the issue is later. Municipal, provincial, federal, you know, I'm going to change the world. There's lots of those people out there that think that. I never thought that. But I, I have been very open-minded to changing my direction on what things are important and what things are not. For me at the time, being completely transparent, in 2016, it was a statement that I kept hearing from people in the community, uh, people with teenagers and that, and even the teenagers themselves. I can't wait to graduate and get out of this community, right? So my thought was, why can't I have them change that to say, I can't wait to graduate and be a part of my community. That's what I wanted. That's that was my focus on things, right? Do you think you've accomplished that in the four or six years that you've been on council? If you listen to my son, no. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but but you know, it's about community, and it's about making sure that it's a welcoming environment. About making sure there are reasons for people to want to be in Lloydminster. You hear things about the new arena project and things like that, where they're talking about, well, we want to be able to build this because doctors and all these high-end professionals 
want to come to a community where they have options for entertainment and options for things to do. And I don't think that's or indifferent from a doctor or a graduating high school student, you know? They all want things to do. They all want reasons to be there, right? So the better we can grow our community in all regards, the more attractive it is for people to either come for the first time or want to stay, want to move on to university and want to come back and start their professional career and raise their family in the community. And that to me is an important thing. So in 2016, you get elected for the first time. What was that experience like? What was that first campaign period like? Because not I'm assuming you were a political person prior to it. Yep. You had probably worked on some provincial. As chamber person, you might not have done municipal because just conflicts, but you might have uh, if you chose. What was that experience like going out door knocking for yourself? Because we have people who listen to this across Canada who want to learn and want to know what that experience is going to be like. For you, what was it like to go ask people to vote for you? The whole thing was humbling. <laughs> it, it really was, right? From the very beginning of that first time you asked somebody, because the first step for us, I'm not sure if it's the same across the country, but the first step is garnering those 25 signatures to even allow your name to run. Right. So I wanted to I didn't want to go to my buddies and say, hey, guys, <laughs> fill this out, <laughs> fill this out for me. Right. It didn't seem right. I want I, I went in my neighborhood to people I'd never even met before, introduced myself, talked about the things I felt were important. And at the end of it, until I got my 25 signatures, I asked for those uh, endorsements. That to me was a gauge of whether I was going to have some support or not, because anybody can get their 25 buddies to sign their nomination papers, right? I wanted to do it a little differently, and I did that. I mean, I had two or three buddies that wanted to sign it, but sorry to interrupt. But did you did you feel like you needed to get people from the Saskatchewan side and the <laughs> Alberta side because you are the border city, right? And uh, funny enough, I am the only Saskatchewan elected official uh, in in the El or in the Lloydminster Council, right? So the seven of us, the mayor included, six of them live in Alberta, and I live I live in Saskatchewan. Saskatchewan. So uh, that's uh, when I go to the Alberta conferences, I am the only Saskatchewan counselor uh, at an, Al an entire Alberta conference of a thousand elected officials. So it's, it's so kind of fun for So your 25 in your neighborhood were from Saskatchewan already? They were. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Because I just walked around up in there. It didn't take me long to get them. And I mean, some of those neighbors I'd known, some of those seen, I'd seen them walking their dog, never really had much of a conversation with, you know, so I got to meet some new people too. So it was, it was a really, it was a humbling experience to get that and say, you know, I had a couple people say, ah, you know, I don't know. I, I, I don't know if I want to sign those for you, right? What, what's important to you? Yeah, I don't, I don't agree with you. I'm like, that's fine, right? Having that separate opinion of, than mine is great. So I didn't, it wasn't like I got 25 people all went, yes, 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 right? There was a couple that had some serious questions about things and asked me my stance on a few things and said, yeah, you know, I'll, I'm glad, thanks for coming by, but I'm not necessarily going to want to sign. Were they more macro issues or more micro issues? Uh, they were, a lot of those were fairly small, okay. small things, but. So you, you get elected in 2016, you are sworn in. What, what duty and sort of responsibility do you put on yourself the moment you get elected to make sure that the decisions you're making are best for the entire community? Yeah. Because as the only Saskatchewan councillor, and I say that because you're a Lloydminster yeah. councillor, but you are the only Saskatchewan resident who is a councillor, you have to look at the entire city, not just the Saskatchewan side, not the Alberta side, but the city as a whole. Yeah. So how much responsibility do you put on yourself to make sure you're balancing both sides, but looking at it as a one city issue? Yeah, and I don't think I've ever looked at it as balancing both sides. Okay. I I've never described it as an issue, right? It's our city. It doesn't matter which side of the border you live on or whatever. It's just our city. So I've never looked at it that way. We make jokes you about You may things. not. I, and I jokingly interrupt yeah. here because I, I worked for Lloyd, I worked in Lloydminster for two years. And I can tell you, while council may not, people do. Yeah. So let's use uh, the new potential arena project as yeah. an example. So I'm a Saskatchewan resident. I live on the east side of the city close to the hospital. So almost as east out of town as you can get. Right. But... I've always felt, even before I was on council, I mean, I'm more educated about a few things now, but I thought, why do I always have to drive south or west for my amenities, right? Why is that? There's nothing going on on my side of the community, right? So now we're looking at building a new arena. and I mean, a bit of it's tied to grant funding, but before we even knew that, I'm like, I want that arena built on the east side of the, of the city because I think that group of people have to drive all the way across town to the major pool, to the splash park, to the major arenas around the south side. There is nothing major on the east side of the city, and I don't think that's fair. That's me, right? So I'm glad that we're looking at land on the east side of the city to build that, to have that amenities. When COVID was on and you weren't allowed to leave 
provincial borders and cross places, right? I made the joke to a, me a former media uh, person in Lloydminster who is now the uh, city council coverage person for the city of Calgary. And he was looking for people that may have seen people traveling when they weren't supposed to. And so jokingly, I sent him a, a, a message and I said, Adam, I said, just so you know, before you come investigating me, I have traveled interprovincially extensively during the COVID lockdown. But to be in my defense, there's no grocery store on the Saskatchewan side of the city, right? So, but as much as that's a joke, uh, it's true. The amenities need to start growing on the Saskatchewan side of the city. So, but you're right, balancing the whole thing is there. Alberta's growing and it always has been since I moved to Lloyd, the population has more than doubled. Right, yep. and it's been growing, but the Saskatchewan side is growing too, and I'd like to see that keep up. So, what's next? What do you see as your responsibility? Because you're halfway through your second term yep. right now. What's on the last half of it? Because you're about to gear up for an election, probably yep. here in about a year and a half. But right now, what's on the agenda for you as trying to address the issues that are facing your city? You know, it's there's so many of them. It's so many. It's so different than the things that I thought. That's what I talked about earlier when I was like, "This isn't what you thought it was going to be." is a pretty fair well, statement. What's right? the biggest educational experience that you had? Was it the not knowing, not being what you expected a counselor's role to be? It, I think it's, it's what I expected to a point. Uh, but for me, it's, I have a real thirst for knowledge and, and trying to do this stuff, right? But you've got to be careful not to get into the weeds, as we call it, right? When someone says, well, what about this, this municipal development plan you're doing? And what about this bylaw and all that stuff? It's not the councillors of any place, not just mine. Any councillor needs to know every single thing about a land use bylaw or a development piece, right? Because if you think about all the different things that run a community, I'm not an expert in wastewater management, right? Those types of things. The problem I have is that I would love to be able to give people answers. You get 30 emails about something, and you, you almost have to say, well, I appreciate you sending me this email, but I have to send it on to somebody else. What, you don't know the answer? People think that we know the answers to every single thing in the city. So for me, finding that balance is, a, is an interesting thing because I'll never ever tell somebody something that I don't know 100% is certain, right? It's okay to say, I don't know. They don't, some people don't like you saying, I don't know. What do you mean you don't know? That's your job. No, not necessarily, right? But finding that balance is tough for me. Over this last six years, I'll be honest, every councillor who was elected in 2006 got a curveball thrown at them in 2019 with COVID-19. Um, you can never prepare for everything, no. but you have to be aware that things could happen on a, a dime change. How, how have you adapted to that scenario where you don't know what you're going to be dealing with a month from now, two months from now, and it goes back to the question of what do you hope to accomplish what are things that you know that you want to accomplish before your end of this term that hopefully can get even on the agenda or potentially start moving forward? You know, there are things like we talk about being the chamber president and the rotary president. They're one-year terms. Yeah. And you go, man, you can't hardly get anything done in a year, right? It's almost the same in this, yeah. in a four-year term, right? So things that we started back in before the last election, so that 2016 to 2020 council, right, building a new fire hall, we just opened that this last this last summer, right? So it kind of crossed over. It took more than four years. Yeah. We're working on an $81.5 million wastewater treatment facility that we have to build, right? It's been going on since like the 2010 council when they were told, hey, you guys have to do something about your water treatment plant. I'm right? pretty sure I saw that RFP. <laughs> yeah, and so now we started working on that. I mean, the mayor, current mayor, did a phenomenal job, deserves a million miles of credit for the, the way he managed to get this project done through COVID and everything else. An $81.5 million project with no change orders and on budget. Wow. And it's because of the delivery method. We could get into the different thing about that, but it's, it's an unbelievable project. So we're, we're going to see that come to fruition and launch October this year, right? This new, this new event facility we're planning for the city, uh, I want to see that through and I want to see that getting going. But it won't happen in this term of council. So again, it's going to be the next council that's going to, you know, and maybe I'm on it, maybe I'm not, but it'll be the next council that'll be to, the opening those doors. How important is it to set up, set up councils for the future? Because you're right, you may be on the next council, you may not, who knows? You may not run, you may run, you may win, you may not win. How important is it for what you're doing today to try and set up the councils of not yep. even next term, but the term after that? Extremely important because I think there wasn't enough pre-planning done for us when we took over in 2016. There were a lot of questions we had, right? And I don't want to be the guy slagging the previous council. That's not who I am because one day I will be the previous council and somebody will tell me all the <laughs> dumb things I did, right? So 
but there needs to be pre-planning. So you look at the documents and the things we're doing now. In 2017, or we're building this new event facility. We didn't know we needed one until 2017 when that council of the day said, what is the state of all city facilities? And administration went, I, I don't know, right? What do you mean you don't know? Right, so we had building assessments done because you need to know that stuff. You can't come up with a 70, 80 million dollar arena build out of the blue. Yeah. You need to be able to figure out when you're doing that. So we've got that. We've taken down buildings in this city, but there was no planning document that said this is the longevity of these facilities. So setting up anybody for the future is, is key, right? You're doing land development and municipal development plans, and we just annexed 22 and a half quarters of land to grow the city, and that's supposed to be good till 2050, right? So when you're talking about setting up the future, you're looking that far in advance. And I use the example of Edmonton, where you just are now able to drive on the Anthony Henday all the way around the city. That land for the Henday was gazetted in 1955, so they could make that plan for now, yeah. right? 70 years plus, right? So you have to be able to leave some planning for the future. A, ne a next council may change a direction completely, but the baseline of everything needs to be laid out there so they have some form of information to base a decision on and make an educated decision because for me the scariest part of any of this municipal provincial federal whatever is we're going this direction oh election happens breaks go on and we go a totally different direction right municipal politics is, is beautiful in that regard that you'll never have it go most likely <laughs> completely the opposite direction there will be some con continuity because it's not politically party based yeah. and that's the thing I love about municipal politics someone said every municipal elected official should have to sh show their political stripe right they should be a conservative they should be an NDP and they should show that if they're going to run for council and I said you know what no it's and the best idea that wins but you are representing the city you're not representing yeah. a party in yeah. the municipal office. and I said to the gentleman I said if you really want to know listen to anybody's answers on a specific topic and you can probably figure out where their loyalty lies on the other side of things, right? But we are the closest... But there's respect, though, right? Yes. Because you may know that there's an NDP or a Liberal or a Green or a Block or whatever. There may not be a Block, but um, at the end of the day, you have to respect everyone who's elected and work together for the betterment of your community. Yep. And agree to disagree. Yes. Right? Because... I can go on record as saying since 2016, nobody has lost more votes than me. <laughs> and it's true. You can figure it out because I will not sleep at night if I don't vote with my conscience and, and I, I don't vote for what I believe is right. But at the end of the day, knowing I'm the guy who votes against more stuff than anybody, um, and I believe I have good reasons for it. I'm not just doing it for the sake of doing it. I'm not voting against it because she said this or he said that. Right? I, I truly believe I'm against it or I'm for it, whatever way, right? Are you for it or is the city, do you believe, for it or against it because you're there to represent the people of your community the yep. people who've elected you but yes you have the ultimate decision that you have to make when you're making these no votes and i apologize i know i said 15 minutes and we're at the 15 <laughs> minute mark but i uh, this is an important question how important is it for you to make sure you gauge the community in what they want with what you want because you're there to represent the city and you're elected to put your opinion forward do you believe that you're best representing the community when you're always against something or always It doesn't matter what I want, right? It doesn't because I, that's the thing. When I vote against these things, it's not just me. If there's issues that I, I'm not comfortable with or I want to find out more about, I go out to the community and I ask those questions and I vote with what the community tells me to do, right? It's not about what I want. I'm a taxpayer too. I, yeah. I live in the city too, right? So I can have my opinion on it. But I'm not voting against something for the sake of I don't like it. I'm only coming at it from uh, an educated background to say, you know what, I, you know, I've talked to people about this and this is what they're telling me and I don't disagree with them. So I'm going to vote against this for that reason. But the difference between this and a, and a provincial or federal or whatever is at the end of the day, the media will come out and say, hey, Councillor Buckingham, you voted against that. Tell me why. I'll tell you why. And at the end of it, I will always end it with, but I respect the will of council and they voted in favor of it and we'll move in that direction. So, I, sorry, last question because I know you have to get going, but... I've asked this to the, the mayor of Lloydminster. I've asked this to Councillor Marin of the, uh, the city of Lloydminster. I'm going to ask this to you. What makes Lloydminster so unique in your opinion? You know what? For me, it's always, always has been, elected or not, it's always been the people. You know, I came there in, in the Gilligan's Island 1997 thing, and it, it isn't just the city, like where it is in relation to this or whatever else. It's the people. You look at everything. I'm running a nonprofit charity hockey game this coming Friday trying to raise money to, to replace a van in the city for our, our uh, people that need that, right? 
there's a health foundation gala coming up the following Friday. They're 150 or $200 a plate meals, right? There's five other charities fundraising in the community right now, and they're all successful. And they're all successful because people step up and help when they're asked. And I love the spirit of community that we have in our community. And I'm sure everybody says that about their own community, but I feel that with our people. I really do, no matter what, what walk of life you come from, you're affluent, you're not, whatever race, religion, background, you know, there's communication, there's, there's collaboration, and I love it all. It just, it, it's home, and that's why I'm still there. Thank you so much to our guests for joining us for this episode of the Cross Border Interviews. And to our viewers, thank you for tuning in and being part of this conversation. If you've enjoyed this episode, please hit the subscribe button so you can stay up to date on all of our latest interviews and special episodes. We have some amazing guests lined up, and we can't wait to share their stories with you. If you're able to, please consider backing the show to help us to continue to grow and produce more high-quality content. Every little bit helps. We appreciate your support as well. A link to our Patreon account is in the show notes. And if you can, please don't forget to subscribe to our Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram for more behind-the-scenes content show updates, and so much more. And finally, as much as we all love our phones and technology, let's remember to put them down and have real-life, in-person conversations with the people in our lives, even if it's just for five minutes. Thank you again for watching, and we'll see you next time on the Cross Border Interviews. And remember, everyone, just keep talking.